excited. It is time. It is time to kick off this book club that we've been talking about for uh, weeks. And um, I know that if you are like me, you're excited about the book. How many of you actually had an opportunity to read it? I'm not trying Spotted to see it. it. <laughs> like okay, over half. <laughs> With that? Over half. <laughs> over half. Okay, that's fine. Part um, of it as well for me. What's that? Part of it as well for me. Okay. That's cool. Listen, you're going to be able to get a lot of great content today, and I'm excited that we can get together and talk about this book. For those of you who are with Keller Williams, you know that Sean Aker was the keynote speaker at Family Reunion, and I've heard so many great things um, from many of you about your experience listening to Sean and uh, what you were able to get, get out of the book. So um, I think that over the next four weeks, we can really dig in and explore more about what it means uh, when we talk about the happiness advantage, uh, what, what it is when we talk about positive psychology. And uh, we do have a big group coming in to participate in the book club. So I'm gonna try to make this as interactive as possible. And you might have to use the chat as well. Is that okay? Okay. So right now I'm going to have you go to the chat and tell me something that you pulled out of your reading or something that you are just excited about in terms of the content of the book. And um, I think for a lot of you, it might even just be the concept of happiness getting turned on its side. Would you agree? Right? So I think if you're like most people, you assume that when you get to a certain destination or when you achieve something or when you have something, you will suddenly become happier. Who's brave enough to say that, yeah, I, I, I thought that, right? And now what we're exploring here is that in order for you to really achieve high levels of success, it's about understanding how to feel fulfilled, grateful and happy first. And uh, it's, it's really that old question about what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? So I'm going to invite you to take notes. I'm going to invite you to really participate in any way you can, if it's the chat, um, if it's, you know, coming off mute and, and, and speaking to all of us. I want to make this really an experience for everybody. So I see that uh, Charles Olson put in the chat the concept that success comes when you are happy, not that happiness will arrive when you achieve success. Yes turning things around. So if we've had this equation all wrong, how do we start to move in a different direction? And that's why I want to do the book club because you know you can read the book and you can get a lot out of it at that moment. And yet do we take the time to actually make change and apply that change to our lives? And that's what I, I really, my intention for the book club is to give you some tangible resources to put into, into effect. Does that sound good to you? Say yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the book explains the benefits of happiness from increased creativity to improved health um, and how a positive mindset can change your personal and professional life. And in addition, I think Sean gives us some strategies on how to adopt a more positive mindset, how to remain optimistic in the face of adversity, uh, and how to just raise our happiness baseline. And, you know, could it come at a better time? The world is a different place today than it was a year ago, two years ago, five years ago. Heck, it's a different place than it was a week ago, right? And so this world around us is always changing. And is it always uh, creating some pressure? Is it always challenging us in different ways, right? And, you know, it's true if you think about your life and you think about all the changes you've come through and the challenges that you may have, um, you know, overcome, it's always about change and adversity. And so how do we keep a happiness baseline regardless of what might be going on around us? And how do we really not just protect that happiness, but foster it so that it continues to grow? That's what we're going to dig into. So on page 15, if you have your book, you can follow along. If you don't, it's okay. You can always just take some notes. <clears throat> Excuse me. On page 15, Sean writes, yet yeah, in today's world, 
We ironically sacrifice happiness for success only to lower our brain success rates. Our hard driving lives leaves, leave us feeling stressed and we feel swamped by the mounting pressure to succeed at any cost. You know, I put a star next to this because he makes a really good point in the book. He talked about it at family reunion that if we adopt this belief that when we achieve certain things and when we have certain things that then we will suddenly be happier. I want you to understand how futile that is because most of us on this call, if not every one of us are, are goal seekers. And so if we're constantly setting and achieving goals and setting and achieving goals and the, and the finish line moves, then we are always delaying our happiness, right? And that's where the stress comes in. So it's about creating the baseline so that regardless of where our life is taking us, we can achieve success. So in the book, he talks about seven principles. That's on page 17. And this is what we're going to talk about over the next four weeks. We're going to break them down so we can, you know, really, I think, digest the content in a way that will help us apply it. Um, and so what are the seven principles? On page 17, Sean uh, lists them out. The first one we're going to talk about today is the happiness advantage. Because positive brains have a biological advantage over brains that are neutral or negative. Positive brains have a biological advantage over brains that are neutral or negative. And then the second principle we're going to talk about today is the fulcrum and the lever. And it talks all about how we experience the world, right? How we see things, our perception. Next week, we'll talk about the Tetris effect and falling up. Then we'll talk about the Zorro circle and the 22nd rule in week three. Week four, we'll go into the social investment concept and then we'll wrap the whole thing up. So before we get into some of the lessons that I have you know, planned out for you today, I would just love to invite any of you to share some of your ideas, some of your thoughts. Did the book challenge you? You know, what, what are you pulling out of this experience so far? And why are you excited to be here on this book club? I think for me, it's a reminder, right? That we really need to take care of ourselves and our positivity really impacts every aspect of our life. So I think there's about, especially with everything I'm going through right now in my life, I think this is really, really substantial for me. I need that extra support. I need that extra positivity. It's really important to your performance. So. Excellent. I love that, Stephen. Thanks. Anybody else want to share something quick before we get in? Yeah. I, I love the, the concept that you can rewire your brain, that you know you need to achieve a certain thing and maybe you don't start out being able to do it. The squirrels kind of came to mind, the monkey squirrels, and you just keep picking at it and picking at it. And eventually your brain actually changes to be able to accomplish what you need to accomplish. And that's something that is just an amazing concept to me. We're going to go into that more today. Yeah, for sure. Your brain is an amazing mechanism and it is something that you can program and reprogram and uh, has a lot of elasticity. So we'll talk about that today. Time for one or two more. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Hi, Deb. Hi there. Um, what I loved is the just the research that uh, keeps surfacing, you know, with people who get a virus and the ones who are more positively thinking about it or studied and they seem to get through it faster and with less symptoms and, and discomfort. And also um, the study with the nuns and the ones who were positive at 20 lived longer, you know, so their long time research that he keeps bringing back to, you know, just keep driving the point forward. I, I, I love just hearing how he's tying them together. Yeah, I think that was a great part of the book. You know, Sean spent over a decade researching and compiling information. And I love that he put the, um, the, the lessons came to life through those stories and makes it a little bit more actionable. So thanks for sharing. One more. I'll say, I love the part how it's, how mind, body, and spirit are so deeply connected and how we can change our physical presence, our, our actual cells, what we're made up of with our thinking and our actions. Yes, for sure. Thank you, Lori. Okay, so let's let's dig in. Um, so as we, we spoke about in the beginning of, of the, the call in the opening, it 
the book challenges our definition of happiness and success, right? And basically helps us to see that perhaps our, our understanding is a little bit backwards or maybe it's broken um, because, you know, conventional wisdom would have us believing that if we just work hard, we'll be happy. If we work really hard, we'll be successful and therefore we'll be happier. And what Sean is really showing us through the writing in the book is what this whole movement around positive psychology has proven is that the discovery really is that happiness must come first. Happiness is the precursor to success because your happiness is what fuels your success. And with happiness comes fulfillment, joy, gratitude, right? And so all of those positive feelings are working to change those neural pathways in your brain. And it allows you and your brain to become more engaged, more creative, more strategic, more motivated, energetic, resilient, and productive at anything that you're doing. So if you have been really, and if you are someone who is a self-proclaimed driver, you're a high achiever, you're someone who wants to live a big life, you want to contribute at a high level, guys, this is it. It's about understanding how to go within and understand how to find that fulfillment. And so in the happiness advantage, like I said, uh, there are seven principles. And today we're going to talk about the first two. Uh, and the first one that we're going to dig into is what he calls just the happiness advantage. And what I'd like to do, if you have paper and pen, I want to invite you to take some notes and I want you to just take a moment right down right now and write down your definition of happiness. How do you define happiness? So write it down. You could just write some, some key words, write out a statement, whatever is important to you and how you define happiness. <clears throat> I'm going to say that if I was to ask you all to share what you wrote, it might all look a little different. Might look a little the same. I don't know, right? Some of us might have the same definitions of happiness, and yet for others, it could be very, very unique. And I think that that's the first part of understanding the happiness advantage, that it's a personal journey for you. It's a personal journey for you. So I'm going to read on page 43, your brain on happiness. Um, and basically uh, what Sean says here is that scientists discovered more proof that happiness causes success when they started examining how positive emotions affect our brain function and change our behavior. How positive emotions affect your brain function and change your behavior. Psychologists have long known that negative emotions narrow our thoughts and range of actions. Negative emotions narrow our thoughts and range of actions, which have served an important evolutionary purpose, right? Like in prehistoric times, he talked about when the saber-toothed tiger is running at you, fear and stress helped you release chemicals to fight that off. Yet, do we need to have that fight or flight today the way we might have thousands of years ago, right? And so is there a better option? Is there a better option for you? And how can you evolve from that thinking? So, you know, he also talked about um, your environment, right? And the hereditary effects of the way that you think and how to reprogram your thinking. Um, and again, I wanna invite you guys to come off mute whenever you want and share or use the chat. Um, so I think we have to look at how do we program our thinking? How do we create this brain on happiness? Because there are a lot of things coming at us throughout the day. Am I right? And your brain has a filter. It's called the RAS, the reticulator activating system. That is a filter that helps you to process this information that comes at you, right? Because um, if I was to tell you all to close your eyes and picture yourself standing on Main Street USA in the middle of a ticker tape parade and picture all of that confetti coming at you, right? There's thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of paper falling from the sky. Can you see it? Can you visualize it? So let that paper be really a metaphor for the amount of information that comes flying at you throughout the day. 
And then if I was to say to you, okay, reach out and grab 145 pieces of paper, uh, forget about how challenging it might be, but just think about, right, trying to collect 145 pieces of paper out of the thousands coming at you. It's a small percentage. That's what your RAS does. Your RAS is filtering all of this information that's coming at you, and it's only grabbing a certain percentage of it. How does your RAS know what to grab? It's going to grab based on the filters it's created that line up with your thinking, your beliefs, right? And so when you change your thinking, can you start to bring in different information and attract different information and start to see the world differently and feel differently about what you're saying? Absolutely. Uh, and I'm just going to chime me. in here a little bit. Uh, Hi, Amber. I, Hi. Uh, I liked that it gives us a construct and tools to use to get out of the funk, right? So like the happiness advantage, those positive emotions, we get to control that. So one of the things that helped me was when we get into the negative, like I can do a few things to get out of state, right? And that was something that was comfortable within that. Because I think a lot of us as leaders of, you know, there's a lot coming at us. Like you said, our RAS is a lot. And how do we train our brains to look for the good and look for the positive when there's a lot of muck and crap coming at us? Yes, yeah, so, so what are those things that you can do Thank you, Amber, that was so spot on. So what are those things that you can do, right, to create your own happiness advantage? So Sean gave a couple of examples in the book, right? Like meditation, just a few minutes a day to have your, your mind focused and your breathing focused and, and how that changes that chemical makeup in your brain, right? What are some other things that he mentioned? Um, looking forward to something looking forward to something with anticipation and how that starts to change your state, change your energy. What else? Somebody else throw one out there that you might've read in the book. Acts of kindness. Yeah, so hi Doris, good to see you. Right, so he talked about having those random acts of kindness be very purposeful, right? In other words, you know, he used the example of don't just hold the door open for someone, not to say that that's not a good thing, yet what, where can you get very intentional about how you want to spread kindness, right? And, and if you were to make a list of, of people that you wanted to shower kindness on, um, or if you wanted to do something, you know, deliberate for maximum benefit, right? Like, like, treating someone to lunch or uh, taking care of, you know, someone's Starbucks order that is behind you, right? So I love that because if you could pick one day a week and make that a ritual, how would that start to change your vibe? How would that start to change your energy, right? And that's how we start to reprogram our thinking. The RAS starts looking for more positive things to bring in because it sees the payoff. Like Lori talked about the mind-body-spirit connection, so your brain feels that payoff. So thanks, Doris. That was awesome. What else did he talk about in the happiness advantage? It started on page 50 in the book. Exercise. He talked about exercise. So listen, some of you love to run. Some of you have great workout routines. But at the end of the day, if we could all commit to just moving our body, 15 or 30 minutes a day, if we could just focus on, you know, creating that movement in the body, the endorphins that are released through exercise boosts our mood and enhances the way that we're feeling and seeing things. And that can in turn enhance your work performance. So exercise is huge. What else? The gratitudes. Yeah. So talk to me about that. What could you do there? Uh, three new gratitudes every day and then a short email uh or text just uh telling somebody the impact that they've made and how grateful you are for them yeah you know gratitude is the highest frequency we can get on when we express gratitude we are vibrating at such a high level we literally are attracting more positive things to us 
And, you know, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, many of you are on my Monday Morning Mojo. And if you're not, um, you can find that group on Facebook. Um, and I'm sure you've heard about and read about gratitude and, and how powerful it is. Yet, are we really practicing gratitude on a daily basis? And what does it look like for you? Could it be writing some notes? Could it be sending a text? Could it be just sharing, you know, stopping someone in the workplace and saying, hey, I appreciate you. What does that do for that person? What does that do for you? And how does that start to create a compound effect in, in the way that our brains are wired, right? So when Erin said earlier that she loved that we could rewire our brain, these are the mechanisms to do that, right? But it requires putting them into action. Any others? There's a couple others that he talked about. Um, using a signature strength how using a core skill, and then he gives some examples of having to find your core skills. Um, I think if you're good at something and you know that it's something that you're naturally able to do, it does make you feel good to not have to work so hard. Exactly, because when, thank you, and when you're in your strength zone, you're performing at a high level with much less strength, but uh, excuse me, when you're in your strength zone, you're performing at a high level with much less stress. So it makes you feel like a rock star. Right. So the first step is to know what your strengths are. And I'm curious if I was to ask any of you right now uh, to share your top five strengths, could you? Probably not. Probably not. I just heard someone whisper in truth. Okay. So there's a few ways that you can identify your strengths. Um, you certainly could ask some people who spend a lot of time with you to share what their thoughts are around your strengths. But again, that's going to be based on their own filters, right? And their own experiences. Um, another way that you can really identify your strengths is by taking an assessment. And there's several on the market. Um, I like, um, so I like this one assessment. It's um, called the VIA, maybe Aaron could put in the chat, the VIA character assessment. And that will help you. And I think it's um, VIA character.org, perhaps. I, I, I should have wrote that in my notes, but pretty sure that's what it is. Um, and that will give you your top strengths. And when you can really connect with that and identify with your strengths, you know, you can't improve something unless you know about it, right? So that's the, the first step is knowing what are my strengths, right? And how do I ease in and work in my strength zone? Because when you work in your strength zone, you're unstoppable. And so not only does that feel good, it's gratifying, right? Which is all around this happiness advantage and how we're wiring our brains. But you're also going to be able to provide more value and come from a higher level of contribution to the people around you. And so, yeah, that feels good too. But let's be honest, you're creating positive change. You're creating transformation. You're creating a ripple effect when you do that. So if we're all working in our strength zone, we can complement each other better too, right? And that's how we can really be much more productive and much more um, successful. And uh, yes, yeah, so Lori put another one in there. Um, this is also a powerful um, assessment. Thank you, Lori. This is Strengths Finder 2.0. And um, I love that one too. And so if you would like to look into any of those, I would encourage you to do that and think about who could help you interpret it too. If you'd like to reach out to me, I'd be happy to do it. I'd be happy to uh, go through your, your report with you. And in doing that, that other person can ask you some questions that can help you really self-discover a little bit more and go deeper into how to use your strengths. So that was one of the suggestions that Sean made. The other one that we didn't mention is to really pay attention to your surroundings. And I just had this conversation with um, some people this morning around aesthetics. I hold um, aesthetics in a high value for me personally, right? So this, this one always speaks to me. My environment has to support me at a high level. Um, and so while that could be one of my higher values, I think we all benefit from knowing that we can put positivity into our surroundings. And that doesn't mean just having like a neat space to work in. It could be really, you know, connecting with nature throughout the day right? Stepping outside um, and, and being very mindful of what your physical environment is saying to you. 
right? When you look around your office, when you look around your home, wherever you're spending the most time, does it reflect your personality? Does it, does it rise up to meet you is, is a statement that Oprah made once about her home. And I love that. Does it, does it say, Hey, welcome home. Does it say, this is your haven. Does it say, this is where you work at your best. You're in your strength zone. Right? So think about that and think about how you, you can really create that in your environment. On page 56, Sean says this, as you integrate these happiness exercises, the ones we just went through into your daily life, you'll not only start to feel better, but you'll also start to notice how your enhanced positivity makes you more efficient, motivated, and productive, and opens up opportunities for greater achievement. But the happiness advantage doesn't end there. By changing the way you work and the way you lead the people around you, you can enhance the success of your team and your whole organization. So I wanna talk about that for a second because I know many of you on this call are business leaders and leaders in different ways. And I know that if you're like me, you read a book like this and, and you kind of go inward around, okay, what does this mean for me? And how do I wanna adopt some of these principles in my life? And that's great. And now I want to take it a step further. How will that start to change the people around you? How can you then be an in, of impact to people around you as you adopt some of these happiness habits and start to rewire your thinking around happiness and success? Have any of you thought about the impact it can have on your family, your, your team, your relationships? I'd love to give you guys an opportunity to chat about that for a minute. Yeah, I've already seen a positive impact with my husband uh, and then my uh, staff at the office. So I was able to hear Sean at a keynote speech in Florida just a few weeks ago. Uh, and it, from that date forward, I started to practice and put these into um, implementation. And when I show up to work, I'm happier. And so my staff is happier. Our meetings are more uh, impactful because we start with gratitude now. Uh, it started to change our whole organization. So it, it's pretty cool to see the ripple effect uh, start. I love that. Amber, what, what was the first thing you put into motion after you heard Sean speak? The three gratitudes, new gratefuls every single morning, and I'm doing it with my husband. <laughs> uh and that email and then a daily walk uh 15 minute walk outside i love it so i've shared in the past um something that uh i've done and uh in full transparency made a commitment to get back to just just today uh yesterday and today is a gratitude walk so i've incorporated the two things together where I can go for a walk and I, you know, can revisit what I'm grateful for and sometimes make a phone call while I'm walking to share gratitude. And, and that's just, you know, how I process being able to incorporate things um, and, and be able to enjoy both at the same time, which has, you know, which makes me want to stick to it a little bit more too. So I awesome. just want to share that. So a gratitude walk could be a, a way to get that done. Thanks for sharing. Um, so who else wants to weigh in on how this can create a ripple effect around us? And while we shouldn't wait for someone else to make us feel happy, which is, again, what Sean has uh, shared with us in the book, yet we can be the catalyst for positive change around us. And so if you think you can't change the world, you're wrong. You can. You can change the world because the world around you is what's most important. So any thoughts on that? Well, I loved the story that he talked about with the gentleman that was going to do a presentation and how the boss banged on the door and told him we can't lose the account. And you know how many times in our lives, both on the receiving and the giving ends of that, you can encourage a person with words or you can really put the burden of everything on them just by how you choose to talk to somebody um, and I think that makes a big difference in whether you're spreading positivity or negativity. 
Yeah, I'm reminded of another book uh, called Multipliers, where you can be uh, a diminisher or multiplier, sometimes not intentionally, of course, right? And so awareness is the gift, because once you become aware of it, then and as you understand the impact you have on other people, you can start to make those adjustments. So thanks for that, Doris. Anybody else? Well, what kind of environment do you want to work in? What kind of environment do you want to spend most of your time in? And do you want to wait for some? Go ahead, Charles. Hi, Charles. I, I imagine a happy environment, but um, I haven't finished the book yet, but I'm hoping that we get strategies as uh, I get to the second, third, and the third, you know, the last third of the book about how do you achieve happiness? Um, I mean, I understand that success comes as a result of being happy, um, but how do you maintain and achieve happiness when you're not at that state? That's what I'm really hoping to get out of the book and, you know, from the club, you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, I mean, like, cause like, what are the strategies for achieving it? That, that's what I'm hoping to get. Yeah, so the strategies are the seven principles that we're talking about. And the first one, starting with this happiness advantage, is preparing your mind right. to, to think differently, right? And so the things we just talked about, like meditating, exercising, expressing gratitude, um, you know, looking at how to, to work in your strength zone, create the environment that supports you. That's all the first step to, to start to change the rewiring in your brain, right? And then the second thing that uh, he talks about, the second principle is the fulcrum and the lever, okay? So um, do you remember the story he shared around, um, <laughs> in his experience, the first time he uh, connected with positive psychology, which was uh, when he and his sister were playing and his sister fell off the bed and he was afraid to get in trouble. Yeah. yeah. Remember that? Okay. So I think that's on page 62, I wrote down in my notes, right? So, so he immediately at this young age, right, to avoid getting in trouble, says to his sister, Amy, wait, wait, did you see how you landed? No human lands on all fours like that. You, you are a unicorn. And this big smile comes on her face and she's like so excited and doesn't scream and get everybody in trouble. So instead of crying, right, she's, she's connecting with this new way of looking at the situation. That's what we then learn about this, this whole concept of the fulcrum and the lever. It's changing your perception or your mindset in order to change your expectations and your performance. Now, I know this group, we talk about mindset all the time, right? The, the question though is, do we really work on our mindset actively, right? We know, and, and so Charles, this is again, how we start to really embody all of this, right? And how do we understand this whole concept of changing our performance in order if we change our mindset, we change our performance, right? And so remember he also shared a story um, about the old men that were in a, in, a, in a study and they were brought in as a, as a group. They were on a retreat and they were told to think that they were 20 years younger for the next two days. I don't know if you got to that point in the book, okay? That's a, a, in, in like page 66 and 67. Uh, what happened to that group of men when they were told to dress the way they did 20 years ago and act the way they did and think the way they did, interact like they were 50 year olds, what started to happen to that group? Felt younger. Say it again. They felt younger. They not only felt younger, they acted younger. They became younger. They literally became younger, thank you. They started to even look younger. Right. So what was that about? It was that their mindset changed about their definition or their perception of their current age. So if if a group of men who are 76 can be programmed to think like they're 56 and that literally changes who they who they are and how they think of themselves, what power do you have? Cauliflower is a pizza now. You can be anything, right? You, you, it's really about what you believe matters. 
Henry Ford said, whether you think you are or you think you're not, you're right. Yes. yes, what is it, Charles? Thank you. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're correct or you're right. That's it. So yeah. how do you change your thinking and therefore change your objectives? Well, I mean, there's a, as a student of NLP, you know, you can do a reframe on any given situation. I tend to do that naturally. Um, you know, like, you know, look at a given situation, you could reframe it and see how well, what else it means. Instead of looking at the negative, you could see what's the positive in that, um, which goes a long way. But, you know, that also, you know, that takes effort um, sometimes, right? Um, you have a lot of negative things going on around you um, or a lot of stresses and you, you know, you can reframe all you want, you know, if you, if you keep getting hit with different things, you know, I'm always amazed. Um, there are some people that I know that always have positive energy are always happy and you rarely see them angry. Um, and even when they are angry, there's an undercurrent of, you know, mirth underneath it. You know, they might be angry, but like break out a smile after they let out a rant. I'm always amazed by those people because they're so few and far between, right? Because I, I struggle to maintain a positive outlook. And, you know, even though I'm able to reframe myself and, you know, uh, look at it in different ways, it's just, it's a conscious effort to do that, right? Um, I'd love to slip in a way to adjust the more natural state of being, um, which is what I'm hoping to get out of this class, you know, to learn strategies for unconsciously, becoming unconsciously competent and maintaining a positive mindset. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. And I love what you're sharing because you're being so transparent and I'm sure you're not alone. Look, all of, this is not a um, quick fix. This is not a snap your fingers and you suddenly read the book and you're this happier person. It's a process. And it is, um, it's a multi-step process and it, you have to start somewhere. And I think that another important lesson to take away from the book is that all of it does matter and that all of it building on each other will help you make that change, right? So, I mean, how many of you can relate to Charles and say like, I just, I just strive for this, you know, and I'm still struggling to figure it out, right? And I think that it, it is about, I think personally, it's about knowing what's in your control and what's not in your control, right? Because if we really focus on, on the world around us, there are a lot of things that are confusing and frustrating and challenging and upsetting and complex. And there are also a lot of things that are beautiful and inspiring and joyful. And so I am not saying put your head in the sand. And I'm not saying to ignore what is important to you, but I am saying for your own health and well being, make decisions about what burden you can logistically carry. Because I believe as human beings, we are not designed to carry the burdens of the world. That's my belief. And you can challenge me. Um, but really, we are not designed to carry the burdens of the world. And while there are a lot of things happening in this world that upset me too, at some point I have to be able to say what I focus on expands and I choose to put my energy here because when I choose to put my energy here, I can see the changes, I can create opportunity, I can be of higher service and value and I can, I, I can impact the world that way. Anybody resonate with that or want to comment on that or, or push back on that? I love the conversation. Anna, I agree Hi, Robin. with you. Hi, um, yes, we are not designed to carry the burdens of the world. And, and as I know, as a mother, as a wife, you, you tend to do that. And it takes some time, some years for you to get to the point to understand that is not your job, but your job is to... Um, to look at yourself, to become a better person. And when, you, when you're focusing on this happiness, you know, changing the mindset, coming to that point of gratitude, coming to that point of understanding that everything is working itself together for your good and that you can be good in that, you know, that you, you're, you're happy in that, you bring peace. And, and that's what I find that it, it brings peace to you. And with that peace, it then now affects, it goes outward. So you do change what's around you, but you don't have to carry. It's not a burden anymore. It becomes right. a joy. 
Right. So, so that, thank you, Robin. And that, so that comes back to, you know, like the first part of the book, that first principle, if you could take one of those seven ideas or six ideas that he shared and put one of them into motion, right. And you could start practicing gratitude or start practicing, you know, exercise or meditation. It might seem small and it might seem trite, but would that start to create an, an, a change, right? And then would if you added another thing and another thing, um, and that's what I mean by it's a process. And, and then you, you move into the second principle of knowing that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so that's how, if you want to understand NLP or neuroplasticity, this is it, guys. The fulcrum and the lever is understanding that... You, the world, one of the things that Sean's in the book is the world is not fixed. The world is not fixed that your reality is relative to you. Who's ever been in the same event or experienced something with another person and you each had a completely different experience, right? Because our, our reality is based on our perception of the world. And so if that were true, then, you know, the world is not a fixed place that our reality is relative to us and to relative to what we believe. And so where, you know, where do you want to fix your attention? Where do you want to put your energy? Where do you want to, to decide, okay, this is out of my control, but this is within my control. So I'm going to put my energy here. So talk to me about that part of the book, the fulcrum and the lever. Or I can keep teaching. It's okay too. Well, I apologize. I did not get to that that okay. principle. Okay. So I'll I'll give you some some uh, references on page sixty three. I think this is an important paragraph on page sixty three, because our brain's resources are limited. Because our brain's resources are limited, we are left with a choice to use those finite resources to see only pain, negativity, stress, and uncertainty, or to use those resources to look at things through a lens of gratitude, hope, resilience, optimism, and meaning. In other words, while we of course can't change reality through sheer force of will alone, we can use our brain to change how we process the world. And that in turn changes how we react to it. So I think that's the answer to Charles' question. You know, what are, what are, how do we start to, uh, you know, find these, these, you know, these resources and these ways to apply this? It's, it's right here on this page. It's a choice. And I think that's also what's most challenging for a lot of us, isn't it? Wouldn't it be easier if someone just said, here, somebody say something? Yeah, basically look for the opportunity in times of adversity. What is the opportunity when times are challenging? What can we do? Right. Um, I think the other piece of this is that, you know, we, we want big sweeping changes overnight. You know, I, I struggle with this and we, you know, I've been reading a lot of uh, James Clear Atomic Habits and going back through that process again, because it's so important to how we operate. And um, so we, you know, we, we want it to be huge. We want the fulcrum to be huge and the swing. To, and we just want to wake up in the morning and take a pill and be stupid, happy, no matter what happens to us. And then have that be who we are every day, yeah. all day, even though we haven't been practicing that for 50 years, we go, Oh, I changed my mind. I'm going to be this different person. And tomorrow is a different day. And then tomorrow's not a different day. The first phone call is not fun. And the rest of the day is set up. For failure. So it's, you know, really for me is those itty bitty little habits, which three years from now will ensure that I am the person that I think I want to be today, that I know I am, it, I am, I'm just not acting like it. And so that that's that mindset of, you know, sort of fake it till you make it or, um, you know, be the person that you want to become. Um, and I, I think Charles, that's probably uh, a lot of where your, your thoughts are like, okay, I really want to be that, but I'm not. So now what do I do? And it's just those little itty bitty changes. Yes. 
that that will then you you are the person you are today because of the habits that you've been doing for the last three years or five years or 10 years of your life. And now it's going to take time to move that needle in the other direction. A hundred percent. I think um, you, you put that so well, Lori, because for a lot of us, we think that, you know, if it's so simple, that can't be it. <laughs> Right. Or we think, oh, that little thing, really, is that really going to make such a difference? Well, it will if that little thing is done consistently over time. Yeah. And yeah. if if you consistently focus on those small changes, I guarantee you another small change will come from it and another small change and another small change. And so that drip in the bucket doesn't look like much until the dripping just continues and the bucket's full. And so that's what this is really about. It's understanding like there's no easy button, but it is easy. It's, it's simple, right? Maybe it's not easy. It's simple. And, and how we just have to start somewhere. And, and so, you know, I love that he started with the first one, the first, you know, the happiest advantage with those few suggestions, like make a choice right now to choose one of them and put it into action, test it for a week and see if it makes a difference in your world. I guarantee you it will. And, and again, back on page 63, you know, I, this paragraph was to me like one of the most poignant paragraphs in the whole book. And, and again, I'll just read to you from the book. Uh, in other words, while we, of course, can't change reality through sheer force of will alone, we can use our brain to change how we process the world. And then in turn, that changes how we react to it. Happiness is not about lying to ourselves or turning a blind eye to the negative, but just adjusting how our brain, but I'm sorry, but adjusting our brain so that we see the ways to rise above our circumstances, right? Because if you allow your circumstances to define you, I say this with a hug, you become a victim of them. If you allow your circumstances to define you, you become a victim of them. I know it because I've done it before, <laughs> right? We've all been there, right? So I, I just found that to be so powerful. And, and it's really about starting to just change the way we see things, right? Um, something that I've shared before and you've probably heard before is this equation E plus R equals O. So there are events that happen in our lives. Sometimes they're happening around us to us, they're happening in the world, but whatever the event is, what determines your outcome is how you choose to respond to it. So the event plus the response is what equals the outcome, right? Hi, Susan. Hi, so I was, I'm was i not sure where this was in the book because um, I, I listened to it and then I've gone through and read, read it. So this may be further on, but sure. it talks about like seeing patterns and how you are, if you are constantly focusing on certain things like certain negative events or negative situations, whether it's with people or, um, you know, situations that occur in your business or relationships, you will always see those. And so like through the, just changing little, um, the way the way you're thinking about things and trying not to always see those patterns, because sometimes the, you're seeing those patterns and that's all you see. And sometimes it's not really that at all. And so you end up responding to something because you feel that you've had that history and you're, that's all you see. So working out, working yourself out of that, you know, always seeing the patterns. I mean, we, we see that in our lives, just looking for something. If you, you can't find your keys and you, or you can't find something and you, you know, it's in this one box or something, and you're going around looking for that box and you can't find that box, but they're not really in that box. You don't, you don't find the keys or things like that. So you can't see what's really there if you're focusing, focusing on these old patterns that you have, these negative patterns. Yeah. So it's kind of fits into what you were saying. Yes, a hundred percent. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Hi there. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you guys? You good look good. Everybody. Thank good, you. Madeline. So what are you thinking? So, yeah, I, I love all this talk, this happiness. And so for me, it's been 
like a lot of these things he mentions are things that have happened slowly to me over the years from different areas, right? And now it's like he's kind of putting them all together and there's definitely new stuff. But like the exercise is what I feel like I learned when I had anxiety years ago. I had a pretty extreme anxiety. And the thing that helped me the most was exercise. I realized walking. And then just um, other people are like Tony Robbins. I used to listen to his books as I walked and would do the gratitude. So it would be like, he would say it's more powerful if you do gratitude while you're like moving and feeling. And so you would do what you're grateful for. Um, you would envision what you want your life to be, um, all those kind of things. So this, I just feel like this book kind of sums up a lot of, and then the meditation. So I got into transcendental meditation a few years ago and that was like a life changer. Um, that's just, and, and it's just sticking with it, which sometimes I struggle with, but I notice when I do it twice a day, what a difference compared to when I'm not doing it at all or doing it once a day, it just, you know, like that 20 minutes of, you know, just breathing and just letting go. And, you know, I use a mantra, but everybody's different, mm -hmm. but, um, all these things are just so, so powerful, but the, the gratitude um, is just huge. And especially like for everybody on this call, who's working with other people and teams, when we're grateful, you know, with each other. And I notice when, when I do it with Kristen and Kristen does it with me. And when we do it with each other, like what a difference in how we work together, right? It makes such a huge impact. Um, so that's my sharing. Um, but I've done it. a lot of these things different times. And I feel like he's, bringing them together and, and then adding to it. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, thank you for that, Madeline. And, and I love what Lori just put in the chat, Lori McDermott and learning not to beat yourself up when you stumble. Yes. Because here's the thing, right? Like uh, Madeline just said it. So I'm not always consistent with it. I just share with you. I, I had this practice of walking and practicing gratitude and I let it go, but I'm, I'm, I'm recommitting to it. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Because if mm -hmm. you beat yourself up about the things that you're not doing, you're falling right back in that negative trap again. Yeah. So just, you know, I think being kind to yourself is a springboard to a lot of this also. So thank you for sharing that. Steven, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, I want to bounce off of Kristen on the exercise, because I think a lot of what we deal with is an athlete's mindset, right? Like in basketball, for example, when you shoot your shot, you go and box out, you're not done yet, right? Like, so if you make a call and it doesn't work out, you're not done, make the next call. So I think it's that grit and it's that determination that athletes have, like, the, it's not over till the bell or the, the bell or the whistle, right? And I think we need to have that same mindset in real estate and just, it's all about not giving up, right? It's all about never, when you fall down, standing back up. Thank you. So I know we're closing in on the hour. So here are a couple of thoughts um, that I want to share too um, around beliefs, because that's really at the root of all of this is you can read this book, you can participate in this book club for the next four weeks, and then you get to choose what you believe about it, right? And your beliefs are the rules you live by. So beliefs are very powerful your beliefs can change. The beliefs you held on to in your 20s are not necessarily the same beliefs you hold on to in your 50s and 60s. And, and the beliefs you held on to on a Monday could possibly not be the same beliefs you hold on to on a Thursday. So beliefs are powerful because they dictate your efforts and your actions. And so as you are going through the book and you participate in this, I want you to really examine what am I believing about this and are my beliefs really serving me or is this an opportunity to adjust my thinking? Because another, I think, um, theme that is woven through this book is that it's all about choice. And that's the part that challenges some of you because it's, it's not even about whether this is easy or not. It's, it's knowing that you get to choose and that whatever your current state of mind is possibly could be based on the choices you're making about how you're seeing the world and how you're making decisions about how to feel about things. And if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so to close, and, and if you have something else you want to share, put in the chat. I want to, I want to hear from you. And so does everybody else on this call. But I do want to share um, this paragraph in closing on page 74. 
Um, and, and this is where he talks about the lever of possibility. So just as your mindset about work affects your performance, so too does your mindset about your own ability. What I mean is that the more you believe in your ability to succeed, the more likely it is that you will. So if you're looking for a place to start, it just starts with the way you think about yourself. And if you believe you can, you will, right? So the second paragraph says, studies show that simply believing we can bring about positive change in our lives increases motivation and job performance. That success in essence becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. A self-fulfilling prophecy. So whatever you believe will be true for you. That's your perception of reality. So give me some ahas or some feedback about our first session. It was, what did you get out of this? Was this a good use of your, your hour today? I think it was, Anna. Um, I think that we need to take this time and focus on we all focus on our, our, our business and, and things like this, but to focus on the self-care in the middle of the day, not at the end of the day, is powerful because it then pushes us forward to continue to um, take care of ourselves and to grow. And so, yes, I find that this was a great hour because it was an hour to grow, to learn. Thank you. Awesome. Glad you're here. Who else wants to share something? I think it I think was you, great. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Kristen, go ahead. Okay. Uh, no, I, I think it was great. I, I've been um, going over it with my coach about how to change the context, which uh, means you change your beliefs, opinions, and attitudes um, so you can approach things in a happier way. And I think it ultimately impacts the result. Um, so if I go in negatively and uh, think I'm going to fail, I'm going to make myself fail. So um, it's something I've been struggling with. So, uh, so he, being part of this group kind of helps uh, flesh out some of the ideas that I've had reading this as well. Excellent. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Just similar to what Kristen was saying, just, just changing one word, one thought, one idea can change your outcome of, of what you're working on. And just rephrasing the sentence in your own head can make a huge impact on what you're doing. And it seems so, like you said, it's, it's you know, simple or easy. Um, it just, it, it feels like a concept that we can all do by just thinking about what we say before we say it and just changing maybe a word or just changing the sentence around. Mm hmm love it. Anybody else? I'll jump in super quick. Um, my aha uh -huh today was when you release yourself of the burden, you actually have a greater impact than you ever could have trying to carry the weight. You are not designed to carry the weight of the world. Yeah, that might take a little time for some of you to, to, to embrace, but um, this was great. I learned so much from you as well today, and it's really awesome to host and facilitate this. So next week, come back on Tuesday at one o'clock and uh, feel free to invite anyone else to join us. We're going to talk about the third and fourth principle, which is the Tetris effect and falling up. And um, I look forward to getting into that conversation with you. If you want to share more thoughts and ideas on the Facebook event page, feel free to do that. That's, that can become a great um, community as well. And uh, I really appreciate you all being here. So thank you so much. I'll see you next week. Thank you, Anna. All right, take care. Thank you.